Yeah. All right. <laughs> um, that one guessed it. Welcome, Hi. welcome, Hi. welcome, everybody. Um, on this beautiful day that the Lord has made, is it not gorgeous out yes. there? Yes. Perfect. Yes, perfect. So we welcome you to back to the adult form, a little bit different, but nonetheless still plugging forward little by little. And uh, I'm just so delighted that so many of you have chosen to come here today. This is such a delight for me. But we are recording, and we also have people who have joined us by a loom a Zoom. <laughs> Anyway, so uh, you know who is sitting here beside me? Our dear friend, my dear friend, Dr. Carl Kruger, who has been so helpful in coming here today because he is currently, well, I'll let you tell them, uh, at St. Luke's. Yep. And uh, so he was given special dispensation <laughs> to be with us, which is wonderful. So let's start just with a little prayer and we will go forward. Dear and gracious Lord, can you see the love that's in our hearts, the joy that is in our hearts to be back together, to hear of your word, to learn more about you, to grow in our faith, to have our faith nourished and just to be together like this. We ask that you be with those of us here and those of us not, we ask that you be with the Coil family, that you help them to feel your presence, that you help doctors with their wisdom, give comfort and peace in the heart. We pray that you be with us this week as we make our decisions, as we make our choices. And above all, we give you our love. In my name we pray, amen. Amen. All right. As you can see on the screen, we're going with Mr. Lichter and education. Sure. Okay. I'm on. All right. So I will talk to you like this this way. I can see you all. Okay. Fine. So we're going to talk about Lutheran education, as this says. So before diving into what his philosophy of education, let's, let's see if he was educated. All right. So we're going to look at Luther's education before we talk about Luther, Lutheran education. So he is, he's born in Iceland, but at the age of six months, his father moves, crosses the mountain, and they hit the Monstelt. So there is a copper vein that is available. He's into copper mining. He'll eventually in, he'll become a copper smelter. So he's into business. He's into industry. And so they enrolled their son at the age of five into the Mounstown School. It's connected with the church. And you're going to take three subjects. You're going to learn Latin, religion, and music. All right? We do not learn German. If you spoke German, you would be punished. That is, that is the way it was. You did not learn. Hi there, Keith. Come on in. Hi. I just want to say welcome. Thank you. Hi there, everybody. Hi. Thank you. And I just want to say lots of thanks. Thanks to Carl for being here. Sure. Giving us off. Thank you to our coordinating team, Elizabeth and Dottie. And um, for, I can't tell you how many times I've been in here on the technology <laughs> front yeah. and everything, just getting things right and <clears throat> planning for the fall. So and for your flexibility and creativity, thank you so much. It's great to see you all. It just stays where you belong. Great to be back. Yeah. Great to be yeah. back. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, sorry to interrupt. We're no problem. Still... Just want to introduce Carl to uh, oh. Kathleen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is the Hi there. Carl Kruger. It's good to the... meet you. Great to meet you. I'm Welcome. Kathleen. Carl's the what, head librarian at the, the seminary. Oh, okay. Professor at the seminary. Sure, yeah. Used to be. He's mm -hmm. emeritus. I now have a title called emeritus. So <laughs> it means I'm a fossil. <laughs> <laughs> but you still get to teach. There you do. I do. Yeah. So we nice absolutely man. adore it. Yes. So yes. are you uh, assistant pastor or I am a field ed student. Field ed student. All right. Yes. First Prince year, Prince. second year? I'm in my second year tonight. Yeah. Prince. Okay. Prince. 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 Yeah. yeah. Princeton. All right. All right. We well, welcome. Thank you. Sure thing. All right, everybody. Okay. Sure. Right. So you're going to learn Latin, music, and religion. And that way, when you, you take it, you learn immediately and go sing in the boys' choir when there is mass. Okay, so you get product, you get your product immediately, immediately there. All right, so he's going to be there for eight years, 
And then he's going to spend one year in Magdeburg, which is north of Wittenberg. He's going to study at the cathedral school. It's the brethren of the common life. And so this is where he's going to study. But the family decides after a year that he needs a little more supervision. And we're going to move him one more time. And it will be probably just a tad bit cheaper. We're going to leave Magdeburg, which I said is north of Wittenberg. And we're going to head over. We're going to head over to Eisenach. All right. Eisenach is the, his mother's family is a very prominent family in this town. And so they have their eyes on him. And so they can watch him. It'll be a little less expensive to, to have him in, in, in uh, Eisenach. Eisenach, we know, is the place where Johann Sebastian Bach will be born, is born. And on the hill outside of Eisenach is the Bach, the famous castle, the famous castle where he will be, uh, have a sabbatical for, it was supposed to be a year, but he gave up after seven, eight months, okay? So here we are, we are in Eisenach, and there's where he's going to start attending school at St. George's Latin School. Wow. And we've got Latin geometry and astronomy, along with rhetoric and grammar added to this. Instruction is in Latin. We are not being instructed in German. You do not speak German. You do not, wow. in school, you do not learn German. Okay, so when Luther translates the Bible into German, he is taking a major step because he's beginning to define how written German, will, what it will look like, okay? All right. So here we are. We are at Latin geometry, astronomy, music, rhetoric, and grammar. So now, why did we go to Mansfeld? Why did we go to Magdeburg? Why did we get to Eisenach? Because dad has a plan for his son. He wants his son to study at Erfurt University. So he's going to head over to Erfurt. This will be his this place where he lives. This is a famous university established in 1397. All right, and he is going to earn his bachelor's degree in one year. So his foundation, his foundation that was laid in the other three schools prepared him for this. And then three years later, we are headed over to earn our masters, all right? So 1507 is a major year. He's already been there for five years. He earned his, his bachelor's and his master's. He's taken his exams and he can now do, pick a profession to study for. So we can do medicine, theology, all right? Medicine, most of your patients are going to pass, so it's not a popular profession. <laughs> theology, you have to be celibate, and father is not interested in celibacy. Father is interested in something else. He wants his son to study law, because then, then Luther can be a lawyer for the business, pro bono, okay, for free. So there's pay, but dad will pay back, get paid back. And when there are issues, you know, he he will try the case as you're in business. He's in copper mining, copper smelting. He needs a lawyer in the family. So he has his, his son start studying law. Six weeks into the first semester, he decides to go back to, to Mansfeld to talk to mom and dad. All right. And he's on his way back from talking to them. And he is caught up in a thunderstorm. And he's almost hit by a bolt of lightning. And he prays to St. Anne, who is the patron saint of miners. You know, let me live, spare me, and I'll become a monk. So there we have that. So, all right. So father's plans are derailed. All right. So what happens? Well, Luther then decides to join the mon monastic order in Erfurt. He chooses this one, the Black Cloister of Observant Augustinians. They are very strict. They are very serious about their business. This is a mendicant order. That means they did a great deal of begging. Franciscans, Dominicans, and these Augustinians were mendicants. They took poverty very seriously, evangelical apostolic poverty. This was very serious for them. So this is not a very comfortable order. This is an order that is going to be working, going to be begging, going to be praying. All right, that was your call to the call. Okay. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Must be God. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So they realize, they realize that Luther has some skills. I mean, he went to university, he got his bachelor's, his master's. He's getting on the nerves of his spiritual advisor. <laughs> and so they decide that he's very self-obsessed. He's trying to self-obsessed. He's trying to get right with God. And so the spiritual advisor says, let's put him back and get some more degrees. To get his mind off himself and get him focused, all right? So we're going to take our bachelor's in Bible in 1509. So that means he can now teach the Bible. And then he is going to take his bachelorate in the sentences. These are Peter Lombard's sentences. 
Uh, this was how theology was thought. Here's an illuminated initial of this wonderful person. He created these sentences. This is the height of middle, medieval theology. It's built around logic and Aristotle. This all comes together. You, this is very important. This logic is there. So logic means, okay, if God is God is all, you know, if God is God, then God is all powerful. Okay, it's logical. God would know everything. That's logical. Okay, God would see everything. Okay, that's logic. So you're making deductions here. The Trinity, it's logical. You just can't have two. You have to have another one. That's three. <laughs> you know, it's logical. You, know, you want to share. And so you have three. So that's logical. Okay. So after a great deal of study on October 19th uh, in 1512, he has handed his, his doctorate in theology. This means he is a doctor of teaching theologian for the church. And part of his job is to critique the church, to call the church back to its foundations if he feels it is strayed. Okay, this is what his call is. He is called to do this. All right. So he takes his he takes his. Who does oath. the call come from? The call. The call would come from just by he's a member of the order of the Black Observant of Augustinians. He now has a doctorate of theology. As a doctorate of theology, it is is it or it's expected. Key. It's expected of you to be a alert, okay. uh, to be alert. Uh, you're a part of the church, you're contributing, you're going to contribute some ideas, you're going to critique the church. The call is ex expected as once you earn your doctorate of theology. So you say, hi, I am Dr. Martin Luther. So then everybody, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> oh. All right, so here's the interior of the castle church. This is where he took his oath. All right, so now, we now know that Luther went through a regular education. He was educated. Now I want you to see him as educator, teacher. Okay. All right. So what does Luther? What does Luther do? He's going to teach at the University of Wittenberg. This is 1502. Is when they are given their permission to form a university. It comes from the emperor, not from the pope. Okay. So this is a new kid on the block. If he's or if he comes October 19, 1512. He has his doctorate of theology. This, this school is 10 years old. So it's 10 years old. You've got universities that are 1396, 1350. You go back to 1200s in certain places. That's amazing. So this is a new kid on the block. So you need to attract students. Okay. So here we are as the educator. So where are the classes held? Well, right now they're going to be in the castle church. This castle church is a very busy place. You've got lectures going on, you've got private masses being said, you've got relics to see. So it's a very busy place, a lot of commotion going on. All right, now, castle church. That's what it looks like when it was redone in uh, 1892. This was not there when Luther was there. This was added onto it. It is the crown of the Hohenzollern monarchs. It resembles the open solar monarch, monarchy. So that was added to this, this wonderful, wonderful tower since they paid for the renovation in 1892. Okay, so here we are in the castle church where we have our lectures. This will be the university later. They, they will put up this building, Lecoria, which means White Mountain. It refers to the, the sand, the, the, the sand uh, around Wittenberg, so the Elbe River. So this is this is this is the university as it will evolve over time. All right. So what are you going to teach? All right. Well, we're going to talk about the Bible. So what do you want to teach? Well, let's see. Since you entered the University of Air Force in 1502, you were expected to read the Psalms, the daily office, in Latin. And so if you're 1502, you've been doing this for 11 years. Let's do with something you know. You know, start with what you know. All right. So we're going to do. We're going to teach, we're going to lecture on the Psalms. But now I'm talking about Luther as educator. Okay. So Luther's method. This is what we've seen this before in presentations that I've made. This is what a typical page of the Bible looked like. The text is framed in red. That's Genesis chapter one, verses one and two. The remainder, everything else you see is commentary. It's called the Glossa Ordinaria. The common, the common, the common tongue of the Bible, the common commentary, and there are several places there were there were additions given to this. You're going to also get over here the commentary of Nicholas of Lyra. He is a Franciscan uh, 
14th century, uh, he knows Hebrew, which was rather astonishing. He was born in France. There was a Jewish village nearby, so he paid attention to the rabbis, to the teachers. He learned Hebrew, and he developed a concept of plain sense or natural exegesis. Let's not run to allegory, first of all. Let's just hear what the text says, and let's and hear what the text is saying to us. And let's use plain exegesis, natural exegesis, plain sense. What do the words say to me? Let's not dive into allegory and build mountains out of this. Let's do this, all right? In addition to this, you'll have a commentator, Nicholas uh, Paul Bergos, who disagreed with Nicholas of Lyra. And then you will have a fourth commentator. The fourth commentator is Matthias Düring, and he's going to disagree with Paul of Bergos. So when you open your page of the Bible, you have a choir. You have a lot of voices here. The Glossa Ordinaria will have Augustine, Gregory the Great, um, Origen, Athanasius, Jerome. So you've got all of these people. You have a, you're hearing the voices of, of a choir uh, on each page. All right. So that's what's Does coming. Does anyone give a full credence? Uh, the Glossa Ordinaria would come first. Uh, would come first. Uh, then it depended on what you wanted to do with Nicholas of Lyra. If you wanted to listen to him, hear him, follow him. That was an option, but the Glossa Ordinaria would come first because it was more, it was older, more venerable. You know, the older it is, the more venerable. Okay. okay. All right. So that's what you're just looking at in the large letters. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth, and the earth was that without form and void. This is all gloss. These are explanations to the words you read. So that's what how Luther is trained. And that's what students would be expected to have in front of them, all of this commentary. Luther's method varies. So this is what it looks like. All right, so here we are. What does Luther do? Well, he's hearing the humanists. Luther is not a humanist, but he uses the humanistic humanist method. All right, this is the title page. You've seen this before. This is the 1560 Erasmus. All right, here he is. <laughs> here he is introducing himself to his readers, and it's a new instrument for all. He doesn't call it the New Testament. He just calls it a new instrument. The new instrument, all right? He's trying to blow the cobwebs off uh, out of people's attics and their memories and get them to think about something new. And then right here, where it's, I, they call this an hourglass. I have never called it an hourglass. To me, it's a word cup. It's, it's yeah. a cup filled with words. And right where the fingers, where the person who was wanting you to offer you a drink would hand it to you, put their fingers to hand it to you, Erasmus put, has, therefore, whoever who you are who loves true theology, read, discern, and then judge, make up your own mind, okay? So here we have this, there we go. Do not immediately be offended. <laughs> if what has been changed offends you, but weigh it, surely it has changed for the better. So this is the title page, no pictures here, we're spelling it all out. And up above, he's giving you all the sources he is, he is looking at, he is considering, or he's working with. So what makes this 1516 edition so revolutionary? Well. For the first time in 1200 years, you see in the left, Western European Christians could read the Greek. They had only known it through the Latin. They had not seen the Greek for 1200 years. And Erasmus is driving home a point. Hi, the Vulgate is translation. Uh, maybe we need to re-examine this. And this impresses Luther. Luther will read the 1516. The library in Wittenberg purchased a copy for this. He will use this when he lectures in Rome on Romans. So he's reading the Greek. When he gets to the Bartburg in 1521, he's there. He will translate the New Testament in 11 weeks, okay? Wow. From Greek to German. Wow. wow. So he is pretty well versed in this, right? This is the up and coming thing. So Erasmus changes it. Let's look at the original language. Let's look at the text. Let's consider the grammar. Let's get back to this, okay? This is the humanistic method. So what does Luther do? These are his notes. Uh, this, is his, this is what he does. He goes to a printer named Raoul Gruneberg in Wittenberg, and he says, look, I want you to print the text to the Psalms, but I don't want, uh, just give me a lot of space between the sentences and around the sides. Give me a lot of white space. Therefore, I can write things. They can write things. Let's read the text. Let's consider the grammar. Got it? So this is Luther as an educator, and right from the get-go, he is changing the traditional format. I want to hear these words. I want to read this text. I want to know this grammar. That's Psalm 23. It says 22, but in the in the Latin 
Bible uh, nine and ten, or Psalm nine and ten, gets divided in the English, and in the but we don't. They don't do it in the Latin, so we're a little off number. So there you go. There you've got it. That's what his text looks like, and it's telling you right away he is he is innovative. Is all right. In Latin. In Latin, always Latin, always Latin. All right. Until down the road. Till down the road. So here we have, here it is, and that D is the is the director, and that you had time and you were bored with the lecture, you make a nice illuminated D, you know, and then it says Dominos. God, you know, God lead me, God lead me. Dominos. So that's the director. And is the director. So these are his notes. Uh, the, his texts have survived for Psalms and Romans. So if we see his notes, we see what he's saying. You can, you, can you read that? Can you read his writing? I can read his can writing. Yes. Yes. It's German wow. script. Mm -hmm. It's German script. Uh, we learned it in order to read what our grandparents wrote because that's all they knew. The Suderlin, it was called Suderlin, but we had to learn German. I, there are a few of us who had to learn German to write to their grandparents. So <laughs> there are only two of us left, Edgar and myself, who can still read Suderlin. <laughs> so when we go, there's going <laughs> to be a little rough there. There you go. So. So what is Luther enjoys teaching and he once said when you know sermon on keeping children in school we're going to get to that. If I were to or had to give up preaching office and what goes with it, I would rather have no other office than that of a schoolmaster or teacher of boys, for I know that next to preaching, this is the best and most necessary position. So Luther in education, he understands it. It's basic, it's a foundation. All right. So here this we are. This is the time that only boys got educated outside yeah. the house. Correct. Yeah. But boys will be educated are the only will only be, uh, boys are the only ones educated outside of the house. Yes, that will change. So here we are, here is Luther, here is Luther as teacher. And so he's turned around immediately and he says he changes the format. This is the way we're gonna do this, okay? All right, so 1517, you all know what 1517 is all about, right? Yes, we celebrate it. Right. What do we celebrate? Reformation. 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 Yeah, we celebrate it with the Oktoberfest. There you go. I was waiting for Oktoberfest, right? <laughs> there you go. So we all know that according to the tradition, um, on October 31st, All Hallows Eve, Luther posted 95 theses. <laughs> he doesn't remember doing it. We have it's an argument within the church. Um, I don't think he had a hammer. There were probably no, you don't give a hammer to an academic. Um, <laughs> they'll hurt themselves. Um, there was probably nails already on there. This was the bulletin board, so he would have just posted it. Um, we do know that he posted two letters on that day. One to, um, uh, oh, yeah. Uh, to his, to you too. Oh yeah, to his bishop, his bishop, uh, Jerome Schulte. And then, um, oh, it'll come to me in a moment. It has to do with the the abuse of indulgences. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, the, yeah, indul yeah. the indulgences. Right. This is what an indulgence looks like. Uh, printers love these things. Oh, wow. <laughs> yes, wow. they love them. Well, they didn't have to worry about distribution. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, they were, I need 2,000 indulge copies of indulgences. They would print them, and then they, here you are. They got their money. <laughs> when you print a book, you have to worry about distribution. Who's going to buy this? So they have that. Oh yeah, there it is. Albert of Archbishop of Mainz, Albrecht. Albrecht, Albert of Mainz. He is the he is the uh, Archbishop. Uh, he is the Archbishop. So he nails two letters. So he did technically post ninety five theses. Okay, so he did post them. Uh, he got two letters mailed, uh, one to Jerome and one to Albert Albert of Mainz. Uh, he did not know that Albert of Mainz was getting fifty percent of the sale of that particular indulgence to pay back the Fuggers because he needed to buy the office because he was already Bishop of, of Magdeburg, which you know of from Luther where he was educated. He now holds two offices, which is against the, the canons of the church. But wherever there's a canon, there's a dispensation. Okay, so here we go. And was so, he doing this kind of in his role to are critiquing the church that he yes. felt called to do? Yes, because it, this indulgence promised forgiveness of sins. That was not what the indulgence was intended to do. The indulgence only took care of penance. It was contrition on the person, the person who felt badly for their sin. Then there was confession. Forgiveness comes through Christ. That's the church always stood by that. The third part of confession was penance. The priest would say, go do something, do, do a good work. 
you know, try to make amends for what you've done, you know, and it was sort of a deterrent, you know, so that you don't do this again, <laughs> thinking you're just going to get away with, you know, so, uh, something easy. So it was usually make a donation to a poor person. So poor people would collect around the church because they knew people would be coming out and they'd toss a penny in the hat, we're good to go. The church bought this up and said, that's this, we, you pay for that, you buy this, and then the penance is taken care of. But there's also the factor of indulgence fatigue. You finally wear out, wear it out. So you expand, you renew and improve. We see that every time in the supermarket, <laughs> new and improve. You improve it. So these indulgences also began to help. They then said, well, it will, it will help anybody in purgatory, your members of family in purgatory. This will help them. Then they expanded it even further. This will forgive the expansion was to the forgiveness of sins. So Luther first is going is critiquing the abuse of indulgences. He eventually will come to question the role of indulgences in the ministry of the church. All right, got that? Did they ever sell indulgences in a pay it forward fashion? In other words, sure. buy the indulgence for sins I'm going to commit. <laughs> Fire insurance. That's how they build all the cathedrals is with the indulgences, isn't it? Usually, usually uh, some, of, some of the cathedrals were built with indulgences. For example, a St. Peter's in Rome. But that's what I was thinking. That's when you see the Pope on the balcony, it's like, oh, we paid for that. <laughs> <laughs> Who is Jerome Schulte? He is the bishop. He is, he is Luther's bishop. He is Luther's oh, bishop. So the bishop and archbishop there. Or the Albert, of, Albert, of Mainz, Albert, Albert of Mainz is archbishop. Right. Yeah. Also, I mean, Albert's the Archbishop, Jerome's the bishop, bishop, but that's the chain of Luther's chain of command. Yes. Okay. You talk to your bishop, and then you can talk to the Archbishop. Got it. Don't bother Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Don't bother Jesus. Right. Talk to these people. He is also Albert of Mainz. Albert of Mainz is also an elector. There are three electors Cologne, Mainz, Creole. That means he casts a ballot for the next emperor, and Maximilian is a old. Maximilian Habsburg is elderly. He carries his coffin wherever he goes as of 1514. Oh, <laughs> Don't want to be caught dead without it. Oh. <laughs> he will die in 1519. So Albert is now playing. He has a huge role. This is this is you know this is a huge role for Albert. Albert. Um, he's a Hohenzollern. And so this is a family. This is a family that is up and coming. His brother puts him up to it. Says you're going to be, be the Archbishop of Mainz, and then you cast a ballot for the emperor. There are only seven ballots cast, so you have a lot of power. But what is not um, often understood in all of this is, all right, I'm going to do this in content. And the content is there's another set of indulgences. There's another set of non indulgences, I'm sorry, theses that were posted in 1517, but we don't talk about them very often, and we should. What he has done is he is questioning the role of scholasticism. And he puts up these, nine, I think it's 97, please don't hold me to that, 97 theses that question, question scholasticism. He's questioning Peter Lombard, he's questioning the whole way we do theology. Remember how I defined it, how I defined it? You know, it's logical. God is logical. Luther is discovering from reading the Bible, no. God is not logical. <laughs> ah. So these are his theses. These are far more incendiary than the ones about the abuses of indulgences. These were far more incendiary. And so he has these, let's just look at some of these theses. In brief, man by nature has neither correct precept nor goodwill. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I don't have my natural, my natural senses uh, the work, okay? It's called, you know, we call it the effects of sin. It skews everything. I have, if you give me the ability to determine what is good and what is evil, I will name evil good and good evil. Yeah. Hello. Right? Yeah. Okay. We are not masters of our actions from the beginning to end, but servants. This is in opposition to the philosophers. I'm at whim of my emotions, my hormones, my vitamins, my whatever, caffeine, <laughs> or lack thereof. <laughs> he says, we're not masters of our actions. So this is, these are far more scathing than the, the indulgences, uh, the, the um, theses over the indulgences. 
we do not become righteous by doing righteous deeds, but having been made righteous, we do righteous deeds. This is in opposition to the philosophers. Yes. He doesn't understand yet the righteousness. The righteousness. He's, he will, by 1518, he will understand justitia de, the righteousness of God, that it is gift. He's still working on us, but he understands we've been made, declared righteous, right? Virtually the entire ethics of Aristotle is the worst enemy of grace. This is in opposition to the scholastics. So he's tearing it all down. It is an error to maintain that Aristotle's statement concerning happiness does not contradict Catholic doctrine. That is in opposition to the doctrinal morals. It is an error to say that no man can become a theologian without, without Aristotle. <laughs> this is in opposition to common opinion. This was the, the basic, wow. after Thomas Aquinas, after Thomas Aquinas, Aristotle was the philosopher. And all of, all of life could be parsed through the lenses of Aristotle. Luther is saying, this isn't working. He's been preaching, teaching from the Bible. And he says, that's not logical. So, all right. So, no syllogistic form is valid when applied to divine terms. That's in opposition to the cardinal. I think this is Beale. This is Beale he's going up, uh, going up against. So these are what he's doing. You know, uh, if a syllogistic form of reasoning holds in divine matters, then the doctrine of the Trinity is demonstrable and not the object of faith. So he's saying, you know, well, it's let's let's back off of this. So Briefly, the whole Aristotle is to theology as darkness as delight. <laughs> He's pushing, he push you in these theses. This is what you were supposed to do. You make them incendiary, you make your oldest statement, and then a student had to defend these. So that's that's what this was this was all about. It was to be a debate. It was to be a debate to discuss this. And it is very doubtful whether the Latins comprehend the correct meaning of Aristotle. All right, so let's tear this all apart. There are 97 of these. Let's take this to text. This is often forgotten. So now, Reformation has occurred. Luther is declared heretic. In 1521, he is declared an outlaw. So he goes into hiding. He eventually he returns to Wittenberg. Now he's setting about to reform and call the church. They kick us out of the Roman Catholic Church, but you cannot kick the church Catholic out of us. Right? What is just Luther by now? How old is he born? He's born in 1483. So you do the math. Okay. That's why they, I went into the past story. <laughs> <laughs> so he's 24. Yeah, 41. 41. Yeah. So he's entering middle age. <laughs> yeah, at that time, sure. Uh, yeah, at that time. Yeah, he's lucky he's alive. So to the councilmen of all cities in Germany that they establish and maintain Christian schools. He realizes with the Reformation, with his, his wish to construct, to reformat the church, he realizes education plays an important role <coughs> because it is through how our education that we understand who God is, how God works, and this is not to be done at the altar, behind, you know, at the altar, this is a part of everyday life. We need to talk about this. So we need to maintain, we need to establish schools. All right, before we get to that, I wanna show you one of the major textbooks that they wanted to use in the school. Remember these things, right? Right, all right. So 1529, he finally produces his large catechism first for teachers and for pastors. That's what we should be reading. That's what we should be working with. The small catechism was, con was constructed for people who had little education, but could at least read something, little education. For those who had been to school, as we all have, it's time to spend time in the, the large catechism. But let's do the small catechism. That's what it's going to look like. There it is, the Enchiridion, the handbook, the handbook, the small catechism. It is translated very early on into Latin because it's going to be used in the schools. In Poland, you're going to use the German. In the school, you will use the Latin. This is the only place where I could find the title page and it's a 1585, but this is what the, the catechism will be translated in 1529 into Latin so it can be used in school, all right? So what is it? A small catechism for children in school, recently enlarged. This means the edition has been expanded. Okay, the, this, this catechism has been expanded. Well, what does it include in it? 
well, if you're going to use this as a primer, as a textbook, well, we've got to get used to consonants, three consonants, and we've got to get, we're going to use, we're going to teach you your Latin using the small catechism, mm -hmm. all right? And we've translated the Ten Commandments on the right-hand side, but we had not really translated them. We've just brought them over from the Vulgate and put them in here. Here we are. Here are our Ten Commandments in Latin. So we are going to learn Latin and our content of the catechism in Latin, all right? So, I could spend time on the 1524, Luther addresses education two times in print. I'm sure every time he had a beater, he was addressing everything. <laughs> but he addresses it, he addresses education in 1524, where he's calling upon, he's calling upon the governors, the people who govern, please form schools, please create schools, please set them up. This is how we're gonna get our understanding of God cleared up, you know, how we're gonna to work together with the church, pastor and teacher work together, all right? This is the, in 1530, this is his second, there are only two where he addresses the sermon on keeping children in school, all right? Now, this is where I, I'm gonna spend time here in a few moments where we're gonna spend some time here because he, he dedicates this sermon. He knows it's gonna be printed. Everything he writes is going to be printed in the form of a pamphlet. So it's very easy to, to pass out. It's very inexpensive. Pamphlets are the new format. It's what helped the Reformation along. This is where the arguments go. All right, so we've got here, we've got here, he, he dedicates this sermon to Lazarus Spengler in Nuremberg. I'm like, okay, what do we got going on here? There it is. There's the pamphlet that was printed, you know, how one should keep the kids, children in school, 1530 in Wittenberg. So he knows it's going to be, he's go, it's going to be, you know, passed around and it's going to be a wonderful moment. We frame the title in a, in, a, in a lovely, we have this wonderful, wonderful frame around the text. This could, this does not necessarily coordinate with the title. That was just a, a Cranach developed that for Luther. So that when that was on a table, that was on a table in a market, you could immediately say, oh, there's Luther because it's got this wonderful illustration. Most printers didn't take the time to put an illustration on the cover of a pamphlet. Cranach, let me brand Luther. Let me give him a trademark. Let me do this and we'll teach theology. Here's the Trinity up here. We have the prophets, the prophets, the law and the prophets. Then we have the, the snake, the, the bronze snake, salvation. And we probably have somebody over here who's very important. So there we have it. So we have this wonderful sermon. All right. So where is it then? Where is Spengler? Spengler is in Nuremberg. What's interesting is Nuremberg doesn't have a university. It's like, okay, well, let's continue the story. This is what uh, the skyline of Nuremberg, 1493, Hartman Schadel's uh, History of the World. It was a revolutionary book. Um, you've got it 40 years into the printing industry and this is what they were able to create. Image and text come together. And this is an accurate representation of Nuremberg. So it was like, ooh, you know, he wanted to sell, he knew that, he knew that Koberger and Schadel wanted to sell the book in Nuremberg because they took the time and the trouble to say, here you are, you're an important city. All right, what? Why is this city important? All right, well, population of Nuremberg in the year 1500 was between 25 to 30,000 people. That's pretty significant. All right, Erfurt has 20,000 people in it. Wittenberg, 2,000. So we're, <laughs> you see where, when you get to Nuremberg, you know, this is a substantial city. It is a city of merchants. Uh -huh. These are the trade routes out of Nuremberg. Nuremberg is right here in the center. And these are the established trade routes. So Nuremberg is positioned in such a way that it can trade with all of Europe very easily. All right? So here we have it. You've got Frankfurt, Leipzig, Berlin, Stettin. Then you get into the Scandinavia, Lübeck, Hamburg. And then you're into Scandinavia, you get to London, Paris, Lyon and then into Spain, down to Rome. These are all the cities where you, could, you have to establish trade routes out of Nuremberg. Uh, Nuremberg also, also imports. Okay, so from Russia, we're, we're bringing in furs. This is all in German, but I will just, these we're bringing in furs. Okay, here we're bringing iron, iron. Here we're bringing in grain. All right, over here we're, we're bringing iron and wine. Oh yes, from Austria, that's, um, uh, you know, you know, so, you know, this is, this is wine. We're bringing wine from Italy. We're bringing wine from Spain. We're bringing wine 
We're bringing wine from, from Spain and France. Hmm. Wine is very important. <laughs> <laughs> Communion. <laughs> For medicinal purposes. <laughs> well, you didn't drink the water. <laughs> you didn't drink the water. So you, you read less. So there it is. So this is, it is a major center. All right. And the people who are important in the city of Nuremberg are the merchants. All right. So this is a very wealthy city. So it has to, it is an imperial city. It is one of 55 imperial cities. That means their tax dollars stay home. Ooh. And so they can use their tax dollars for the fortification of the walls, the city, its expansion. This is what this is what we do when we are an imperial city. Air Force wanted to be an imperial city, but it never got permission. So one of the great dreams was to be an imperial city. So here we are, the merchants. Notice the universities. Here's Wittenberg, 1502, but Erfurt was 1379, Heidelberg, 1386. This is the Charles the, in Prague, 1348. You know, you go back, you see some of the, you know, Pavia is 1361. You can see the dates of some of the very established schools, Trier, Tübingen, you know, and then you have, you have, you have all of this here, all of these wonderful universities, but Nuremberg's not there. Because Nuremberg doesn't have a uni university. All right. So, who is Lazarus Speng Spengler? He's a. Oh, hi there. Uh, <laughs> he is a he is a um, town clerk, but don't think of it as a town clerk just pushing a pencil and moving papers. He is a person of power. He is a person of power, and so this is uh, Lazarus Spengler. Um, he is. This is the Rift of Excommunication for Luther from Leo X. Lazarus Spengler is also named in this pamphlet. So it was just Luther. There were a number of people who were going up for excommunication and it was Lazarus Spengler because early on he became a Luther supporter. And he was known in Nuremberg for his outspoken um, backing of Luther. So he is up for excommunication as well. So this is from Leo X. Bull is dated June, June 15th and it's published on July 24th. So here we have it. And there's uh, Leo X. There he is. All right. Leo X, you know, rise up, O Lord. Arise, O Lord, and judge your cause. Remember your reproaches. The wild boar from the forest seeks to destroy it, and every wild beast feeds upon it. He was on a hunting, on a hunting expedition when we got word of the the, the the posting of the thesis, so he, he sort of was in an angry mood, in a hunting mood, in a hunting mood, so there it is. But Spengler is named also in the writ of excommunication along with Luther. And he is then officially excommunicated on January 3rd, 1521, along with Luther. All right, so what does Spengler do? Spengler is very involved in Nuremberg. He promotes Lutheranism. Nuremberg embraces Lutheranism very early on. They take this, the Benedictine Abbey, and it was called, called St. Egidium, in English it's St. Giles, and they convert it to a gymnasium. The gymnasium is a high-end Latin school that preps you for university. So here we are. So this is Luther. Luther says, if my son can read and do arithmetic, that is enough, and we now have books in German, etc. Such a person sets a bad example for all the other good citizens. What he was saying is, okay, you can read the books, you have enough to do a certain trade in German, but that is not going to be sufficient for what we need. We need higher education. And please, when you have a person who is gifted, who can do these things, let's back that person. All right. All right. So he is saying, you know, Germans are sometimes you're, 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 you say, okay, it's what was Luther's father's, you know, you're going to become a lawyer. And then you're going to do pro bono work. You've made it. You don't need any further education. You're done. You've got a job. Hold on to the job. Be stable. Luther is saying we need something more. And so he's writing to a city that is packed with merchants, no university, but calling them to say we need to promote universities and good schools, teaching in Latin. Okay? Latin is not abolished in Lutheranism. This is not the Reformation that abolishes Latin. So it's, we are bilingual, bilingual people. So we need, especially we, need especially every community, especially a great city, must have many kinds of people besides merchants. Now who knows? This is going to be printed. It's going to be passed out. So everybody's going to be reading this. 
and they're going to be saying he's reaching a he's reaching an international audience. Okay, he's reaching an international audience. Because we need people educated for preaching, governing, administering justice in both spiritual and worldly states. And all the learning and languages of the world are a little too, are too little to say nothing of German alone. You need to be multilingual. You need to have that Latin education. You need to cross national boundaries. You need to be able to read it all, not for compromise, but for comprehension and for to administer in church and state, church and world, you know, the two kingdoms. We need good education. So, so the public or the um, that depends. What he's asking them, what he's asking them to do is to create scholarships for those who cannot afford to go to school, but who have demonstrated their talent, have been identified as you know talented, but they don't have the money. He was so far reaching. Yes. So ahead of his because time. he knew he knew that this depend all of this hinged on this. Because he says, if we don't, if we don't, we'll be just a disorderly, uh, wild crowd of Tartars and Turks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We know how he feels about that. Yes. That's all right. Probably just a, an eraser. All right, the estate I'm thinking of, and he says, there's the, he's the first important is a preacher. You know, we got to have the office of preacher for word and sacrament, spirit and salvation. You know, boom. This includes pastors, teachers, preachers, lectors, priests, sacristans, schoolmasters. You know, this is what we're working on, right? And he keeps talking about this, you know. You know, for the gospel of the church must abide until the last day. Who will do it? Oxen and horses, dogs and swine will not do it. Neither will wood and stone. We men shall have to do it, for this office is not committed to oxen and horses, but to us, men and women, now. But, you know, it's committed to us. So we got to do this. We've got to raise them up. We've got to raise them up. So here you are now. Just look at what your son, daughter, the pastor, the school teacher does. Not just one of these works, but many. So he's saying, look how wonderful, look at what they do. Look, look at the amazing office they hold as a result of their education. Please move forward with so we keep children in school. All right. So you now we can keep reading and all of this, and it keeps right on going to earn a livelihood. And we'll wrap it up. We'll get some questions here. So even though a boy who has studied Latin should afterward learn a trade and become a craftsman, he still stands as a ready reserve in case he should be needed as a pastor in some other service of the word. So we can have preacher and pastor. There are two offices in the Reformation, and the large catechism is written for the prediger and pastor. For the preacher and the pastor, it is, it is office of, in the Episcopal Church, it's the office of the deacon. It's your first ordination. You may now read the gospel in the, in the Eucharistic service, and you may preach, but you don't celebrate the sacrament. So, and that is an accepted office, okay? So that you are, you, you may read the gospel, you may preach, and then you may also move forward and also become the pastor, where you are also an office in word and sacraments. And in the Lutheran Church? Well, we have, we have, um, well, we don't call them office, we have deacons, and they wait on tables. <laughs> uh, they do both social ministry. I'm sorry, I put it in the wrong way. I'm, I'm reading it Greek, you know, go we'll wait on tables. That's what Jesus told, Jesus told the disciples last week. Go wait on the tables. Be a, it says be a servant of all, but it's a diakon. The word is diakon. So wait on tables, you know. So we don't make a distinction between priest, preacher, and pastor. Not here. They used to in, in Europe. They used to in Europe they were, because you needed people to teach school and to preach, to hold services. You also needed people to do funerals, and sometimes the pastor couldn't be there, so the school teacher did it. Mm -hmm. So ordinary pastors, however, must be able to use Latin. They cannot do it without any more than scholars do without Greek or Hebrew, as Augustine says, and canon law prescribes. So there I am. So there we are. So let's do this quickly. You know, unless something is done about this, we must all become partners and Turks. Or either that or incompetent schoolmasters will become doctors and counselors at court. So if you don't educate and you get bad product, well, who's to blame? You? So there was never a better time to study than right now. And then here's where he's talking about scholarships, you know, how we can set this up and make this work. So there we go. How many educated men are needed in the fields of medicine and other, other liberal arts? So we need all of this. This is a part. This addresses us. Diligent and upright schoolmaster or teacher or anyone who faithfully train, trains and teaches boys can never be adequately rewarded or repaid with any amount of money. Do I hear an amen? <laughs> there you go. So there you are. So it is the duty of the temporal authority 
state to compel its subjects to keep their children in school. There you go. So here we are. All of this is coming together. Well, then, my beloved Germans, I've told you enough. <laughs> so that's how Luther ends the sermon. Well, my beloved Germans, I've told you enough. Well, then, my beloved Upper Dublin, I've told you enough. <laughs> the end. So there you have it. So was education free at the time, or did the, the parents have to pay for it? And that's why some of them didn't continue sending their children. Correct. Yeah. They didn't. Um, not everybody could afford it. There were stipends. There were stipends that were there. Um, there were stipends that were available in certain instances, um, sometimes to the school, sometimes by a person who, rec who had money, recognized somebody in their town. This person is gifted. I will fund this person to go to school. Oh. Okay. So there were, there were several avenues to get there. Um, there was also, and he brought it up in his sermon, um, you also went begging when you were in school. When he's in Eisenach, it was he would go out singing and beg for bread. Panem propter deum, you know, bread for, for the love, for on behalf of God. Um, that was accepted. That was expected. And so he says in his sermon, if your son has to go out and beg, that's oh, okay. It's a nice thing. I've done it. I've been there. Been there, done that. You know, go do it. So, yes. Yeah. How can you explain how? far ahead he was in his thinking about education and its value in society and its uh, contribution to society. I mean, he seems almost revolutionary. Uh, he's probably, he, yes, uh, because he realizes that there's a great deal of responsibility placed on us, um, placed on us. And so he's saying, you know, we all bear this. We're all in on this. We all bear responsibility. We we are all responsible for. We are all responsible for society. We all have roles. We all have, as Luther and Lutheranism will proclaim, vocations. Okay, vocation in the, the medieval piety was priest, nun. Luther turns it around and says, all of us have vocations. All of us carry a vocation. If it's a school teacher, that's your vocation. If it's cleaning the floors, that's your vocation. If it's mining, that's your vocation. And you do it to the best of your ability. As my father would say, if you're not going to do it, do it well done. Don't do it at all. <laughs> so he's, he's, he sees this as, as uh, very important. And he realizes that the church needs this, that the church needs people who understand who understand the value of the value and the joy of the gospel. You know, the value and the joy of the gospel. You know, and I wanted you, I want you to hear this. And so he will then move forward. And it, at home, you're going to read the small catechism in German. Mm -hmm. you're, going to, you're going to use the small catechism in German. But then you're also going to realize Latin is equally important because Latin opens up a whole new world beyond your, your German. You can be international. You hear the voices you take in the rich sources of the rich sources of knowledge that are there, and then you make the call. Yeah. So did you say that the large catechism was written in Latin and the small catechism? No. They were both. They were both written. Both written in German, and then they were translated into Latin. Hmm. Oh, okay. And how did Hebrew fit in? Hebrew. He, the catechism will be translated into Hebrew. And uh, Hebrew and Greek, so it will be it will be German, Latin, Hebrew, and Greek. Uh, we have a copy in the rare book room at the seminary uh, with all four languages of uh, Greek, so that you could, if you were if you were of a Jewish background and you wanted to know, here wow. read, wow. read. You know, if you're Greek or if from the Orthodox tradition, read. You know, who who are you? What do you believe? Here, do seminarians still? Are seminarians in the Lutheran Church still required to learn Hebrew, Greek, and Latin? No, not Latin. Not, not Latin. Latin. Not Latin. But but Hebrew and Greek because that's the original the foundation. text of the yes. of the Bible, Old mm -hmm. Testament, New Testament. You. <laughs> <laughs> He's forming his words. <sighs> yes, <laughs> I'm being recorded. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Let me put it, put it to you this way. Um, you are, 
um, I came out of a different tradition. Uh, you know, you had I had two and a half years of Greek, and I had a whole year of Hebrew, and we were expected uh, in Hebrew to translate sentences into Hebrew, so that with the correct vowel pointing. Um, so I came out the tradition that that was. Uh, <laughs> it's Good memories, I can tell. <laughs> Let me put it this way. What, what the goal of learning these languages is that when you open up biblical commentary and somebody starts pointing out the importance of a piece of grammar or a word that you understand, you, it, it's not Greek to you, if you understand my pun. You know, that this is the tense of the verb. This is, this is the construction, the construction of the sentence. It's what the humanists are saying, read the text, look at the grammar. And that's what we're concerned about, okay? So, and so let me put it to you, let me say this. Uh, we look at, at seminary, we are looking at the whole person, okay? If, you're, if you get a C in Greek, you get a C in Hebrew, that's not going to stop the ordination process, okay? <laughs> Trust me, it's not. <laughs> Trust me, it's not. How much do they get now of that? It changes, and I don't know what the seminary is doing now, but I also know this, that there are there's software that seminarians are expected to buy. And the software, uh, in, we had to memorize the declensions of nouns and the conjugations of verbs. Right. And we had quizzes on that. The computers do all that now and it, it, you know we want you to understand this and work with it as opposed to learn it close the book i pass the exam i'm out of here <laughs> right so it's a part of it's still a fundamental it's still a fundamental part of the education process but it is in in my day it was well sometimes it was used to make or break you in terms of being a pastor you were judged on that alone and there's far more to being a pastor than just knowing how to decline a noun and conjugate a verb. So, you know, and I, okay, so that's, it's important. It is important for a different reason. But let's say, you, it's just so when you read the commentary, when somebody does that, it's like, I understand what they're saying. Good to go, let's go. Yeah, yeah. I get that. You have a Missouri Senate background? No. Oh. <laughs> well, we, we do. So, oh, 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 yeah. you yeah. too. Yeah. Well, my uh, wife and I, I think well, a few yes. others. Vicky yes. also. I do too. too. All right. <laughs> I feel for you. I know. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. What's well, I, and I, and you know, that, that question I asked about seminaries, I would, whatever applies at uh, ULS, I, I may be entirely different from what's at Concordia St. Louis. Mm -hmm. Uh, my hunch, I don't know, but my hunch is they still probably do it the way they insist on it. They insist yeah. on it to, to yeah. a point, and that's fine. You know, if that's your tradition, fine. Um, but for us, it's like it's a it's a foundation, important. Let's honor it. Let's do it. But if you have trouble with, if you get a C, don't panic. Yeah. Don't panic. Don't panic. It's no judgment on you. You know, and we're looking for other things as well. Carl, and it was it a that, hard sell for Luther? Uh, was it this view picked up? This? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Somewhat. If you read the introduction to the large catechism, he's very angry because it's not being picked up fast enough. If we, we read the introduction to the large catechism, there are two introductions and in he's writing it from Castle Kroger. Um, he is very, um, he's not happy with this. Uh, it's, it's an uphill battle. Is education is an uphill battle for us? Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, there you go. <laughs> Yeah. Because it's a, a question of tangible results and what's the payback? Luther's spelling out what the payback is. You're going to get great pastors, you're going to get good lawyers, you're going to get good doctors, you're going to get good people, you know. But it's predicated on something that's going to happen in the future, so you don't right. get an immediate return. Correct. You're investing. You're yeah. investing in the yeah. future. And he realizes that you're investing in the future. Okay, so have a yeah. larger vision. And so if that's one of the, you know. It's an investment, so you get better product. <laughs> well, okay, he made that argument, but then did all the electors and the uh, city leadership, did they do what he was urging? Did they start all these schools in Germany some of them back did. then? Some of them, Nuremberg did. Nuremberg did, and so he's putting Nuremberg up the same. thank you for doing this, and he's holding it up to other cities. 
follow their follow their lead. Nuremberg, I thought I put the slide in, but I forgot. Uh, they will hire Camarius, a Camarius, and a famous poet to come and teach in that this gymnasium, and that is highly, highly, highly respected. <laughs> that's God. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'll get back to the Holy One. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm looking at the... Uh... It's 1201. <laughs> <laughs> right there on my computer. It's 1201. They'll have to pay you overtime. <laughs> <laughs> well, as always, we got what we expected. Excellence. Yeah, um, that's thank great. You, thank you, thank you. Oh, thank yes. you.